Well, I sort of uh, have nothing left to say after Coach K explained how to manage millennials, so we're all set. Um, but I thought I would um, do a couple things here today to help you all in your uh, enormously important work. We are going to talk about millennials. We're going to talk about millennials and give you some advice on how to deal with them in a variety of settings. But before we do that, we wa I want to start with uh, putting the millennial generation in the context of other generations, because uh, looking around at the audience, even though I too am a member of the silent generation, I suspect that a number of you are boomers. And so I thought I might uh, begin our conversation today uh, with the boomer, uh, boomer, baby boomer generation's most famous and favorite movie. Just the opening clip. How many of you have seen this movie? <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. Watch a generation announce itself to the American public through the marvel of, of one of the best directed movies ever. And notice the generational tensions in the beginning of this movie. Hey, what's the matter? Yes, we're all downstairs, Ben. Waiting to see you. Ben, can you explain to what I have to do room for one? These are all our good friends, Ben. Most of them have known you since, well, practically since you were born. What is it, Ben? You just worried? Well, and that was. Just about my future. What about it? I don't know. I want it to be. To be what? Different. Anything wrong? No, no. We're just on our way downstairs. The Carlsons are here. They are. Well, come on. They came all the way from Tarzana. Come on, let's get cracking. It's a wonderful thing to have so many devoted friends. Hey, there's the award-winning scholar. We're all very proud of you, Ben. Thank you, Mrs. Carlson. Is that the new car out there, that little red wop? Sure. That's Ben's graduation. Well, you won't have much trouble picking up in that, will you? Yes, sir. The girls, the chicks, the teeny boppers. Oh, I think Ben's got me on the teeny bopper stage, haven't you, Ben? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I'd just like to check something on the front for a minute. It's not about him, an elderly male. Hey, here's a track star. How are you, track star? Sorry, Mr. Wilkes. I want to get a drink. Tell him you're all about that thing that you won, that Hopperman Award. Hopperman. Hopperman. Right. You wait right here. <laughs> We're all so proud. Proud, 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 proud. What are you going to do now? I was going to go upstairs for a minute. Oh, I mean, with your future. You're lying. Well, that's a little hard to say. Ben. Excuse me. Mr. McGuire. Ben. Mr. McGuire. Come with me for a minute. I want to talk to you. Excuse us, Joanne. Oh, Thank you. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, I will. Plastics. Looks out of There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Yes, I will. I'm set. That's a deal. So this is the point at which the boomers announced that they were going to build a future that wasn't going to be artificial. It wasn't going to be plastic. It was going to be based upon real values. And the generation has devoted itself to the exploration of values and the insistence that society run according to the right values for the rest of its life. Now, as you may remember from the movie, the older generation, which Tom Brokaw later would call the greatest generation, the GI generation, portrayed there in that very claustrophobic 
interrupt and say what the other person, what the younger person is trying to say. That generation is portrayed in the character of Mrs. Robinson as a generation out to seduce, literally, the boomer generation and keep it from pursuing its values. And at the end, uh, Benjamin Braddock rescues the love of his life, the young Ms. Robinson, from a f arranged marriage that neither one of them wants to see happen. And he does so by taking the cross from the church and using it to bar the doors for the wedding party, keeping them from coming after them as the two of them ride away to this unknown future on a school bus. And that entire conversation about values became one of the defining characteristics of the generation in the movie. And I'll show you a couple of them more. That coming of age movie about boomers was a enormously important cultural shift. So what is it about generations? Why are the people in that clip that you just saw so different from each other? Is it simply a matter of age or is there something more going on? There's a couple of gentlemen, one no longer with us, uh, William Strauss, the other still very much with us, Neil Howe, both of them residents of this area, who wrote a book in the late 80s and then early 90s called Generations that established the field of generational theory. And they defined a generation as a cohort of people born roughly over a 20 year span who share a common location in history, common beliefs and behaviors, and who believe that they are a member of, the gener of a generation. So if I had asked you, not only had you seen the movie The Graduate, but how many of you consider yourself baby boomers, a lot of you would have raised your hand knowing full well that that name tag uh, meant something about your beliefs and behaviors, the friends you had, and the experiences you've encountered. In our books that we wrote together, Mike Hayes and I, both Millennial Momentum and the earlier one on Millennial Moment Makeover, we focused on the reasons behind this definition and actually added one to the theory, more so than simply using that definition. And what we said was that one of the reasons that the generations have different beliefs and behaviors is that they were raised differently. Now I want to assure you before I start in down this path that I am not about to give you a lecture in astrology. I do not believe that who you are is dependent upon the year, let alone the day and the stars under which you were born, right? But there are real identifiable, we use survey research to do it in our books, uh, there are other ways of doing it. There are real identifiable differences in people's beliefs and behaviors that can be seen when you pull them apart by these generational time spans. And one of the most important reasons for that is the way kids were raised. And in America, where this theory is probably most strongly felt because of the size of our populations and the fluidity of our society, we have, most Americans, only one thing we can agree on, on how to raise kids. And you heard a little bit of that from Coach K earlier this morning. Basically, if you ask any American how to raise, how they're going to raise their kids, they will tell you they're not sure, but it isn't gonna be the way they were raised. And that, of course, since there are about four ways of raising kids, creates a four types of generational cycle that over an 80 year span repeats itself, and I'm gonna show you some of that. Um, and so we change how we approach child rearing. Right now we're in the middle of a new debate, if you're not into parenting, we're into a new debate among parents about how to raise kids. We're moving off the millennial methodology for a new generation that's just coming into grade school. But this is just part of the normal cycle. The second thing that happens that causes generations is, and this is where Strauss and Howe focus most of their attention, is events occur during a time period that psychologists call the age of maturation, roughly between the ages of 17 and 25. Now notice that's only eight years, not 20, which makes the generational question of 20 years a little more fuzzy. But nevertheless, it's still true that it's an important piece. 
at, between the ages of 17 and 25, psychologists will tell you that almost all of us reach a judgment about how the world works. We do so absorbing the lessons from our parents, taking in the input of our peers, particularly our generational peers, but also the lessons that, ex that events in the world have taught us. And psychologists will also tell you, and social sur science survey research will prove, that once that decision about how the world works is made by the age of 25 or so, it doesn't change for the rest of your life. And you know, we're not talking about whether you like a certain food or not. We're talking about fundamental things like people are successful in life because they work hard, or luck has a lot to do with a person's success. You believe one or the other of those propositions, you don't believe both. And which one you believe is pretty well settled by what you learned by the time you were 25, what you thought you learned. And therefore, events have a major impact on generational change and on generations. Boomers are defined by Strauss and Howe as the generation that remembers personally the moment when JFK was assassinated. And they believe that the next generation, Generation X, doesn't have that personal memory, and then that's a major distinction between those generations. The last thing we added, which I won't have time to talk about today too much at all, except to point to social media, is the change in network technologies that influences how a generation communicates with each other and absorbs information. Uh, boomers were raised on television. Uh, the GI generation was raised on radio. Gen Xers were raised on cable television. I want my MTV. And millennials were raised, of course, as you've all noticed, if you've had a chance to interact with them, on social media. And those, having, those different architectures, the first few being broadcast technologies, one person telling many others what to hear, when they should hear it, how they should hear it, is enormously different from social media, which allows everybody to make all those decisions themselves, to become producers of content if they want, to determine on their own what they're going to listen to. It's very important for all of you to understand that distinction because it makes millennials enormously uninterested in expertise. Right? They don't actually think that truth resides somewhere in the center of a broadcast empire. They believe that truth resides in the opinions of their friends. Or as the economists put it a little too boldly, millennials get up in the morning and call their friends to see how they should feel. <laughs> so here are those generational cycles. Um, we've talked a little bit, and some of us have been willing to acknowledge just how old we are by saying silent generation. Talked a little bit about GIs. Let's stay for a moment on boomers. Strongly adhere, as I said earlier, to their personal values and therefore won't compromise on fundamental questions of right and wrong because no one can get you to compromise your values. No one should be asked to compromise their values. And if all the boomers had a similar set of values, we'd be home free. The only trouble is half the boomers have one set of values and the other half have the other, right? And the best examples, unfortunately, are in this town. And uh, also, if you think about Presidents Clinton and Bush, both of whom very much baby boomers, both of whom had uh, second Bush, both of whom had very little agreement on ideas. But boomers use those ideals to provide meaning in their life. And because they are equally divided, they have created a divided society. Boomers obviously are a large generation, no longer the largest. Sorry, millennials are bigger than boomers. Uh, there's 95 million millennials around today. And by the time they're, we've absorbed the immigration, it could be over 100 million. But boomers grew up in an era of social stability, leave it to beaver kind of environment, where standards began to loosen, particularly when the economy was booming and the world was safe. And so they started a whole bunch of negative social trends, which they've taken with them through their life. And you in the medical profession have probably noticed that suddenly as boomers turned 50, we had an outbreak of things that we hadn't seen among 50-year-olds before, such as uh, injuries in extreme sports that they shouldn't be playing, but, um, but also even on things like binge drinking among 50-year-olds, right? Trying to relive their college days. All of the negative social trends in America began with the boomers, and boomers continue to bring those negative social trends to their behavior. 
good news for your profession is they're not going to be with us forever. Okay. <laughs> We've talked about their polarization, and, and for those of you into Star Wars, in the Star Wars wonderful allegory, they are the Obi-Wan generation. Well, along came Xers, roughly 63, 65, depending upon where you want to date it. Some dated as early as 1961, which would change the generational allegiance of our president, but they're not, this is not individual stuff, it's group stuff, right? And in the cycle of Strauss and Howe, all four of which are now up there, these are four names for archetypical generations that go back to the beginning of American history. The first civic generation was the Republican generation, not because they were Republicans, but because they founded the Republic, people like Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. All right, and then after that comes an adaptive generation. The, the old one living today is called the silent generation. The new one, the eight-year-olds and younger, doesn't quite have a name yet, but people think it'll be called the pluralist generation because they're going to be the first generation in America to live in a society at its majority minority. And last year, for the first time, American babies, there were more non-white than white American babies. That's the sign of that upcoming generation. Adaptive generations, because I'm a member of it, are nice. We're not going to talk about them because they have absolutely no influence at the moment on American society. But they do help smooth things over. Uh, the idealist generation, like boomers, are driven by their ideology, formerly missionary generation, transcendentalists, all those sorts of folks in American history were members of that generation. After the one of those, with all of its conversation about the importance of values in public life, the rise of uh, ideologically driven and doctrinally enforced religion and those sorts of things that idealist generations create, comes a generation that Strauss and Howe aptly label reactive because they react against all of that rhetoric and all of that conversation and sort of retreat back into a more inner fixated world. And while they're cynical and anti-institutional when they're young, because of the way they're raised, which is essentially uh, no child raising, uh, that is parents are off doing important things, not worrying about their kids in these, in these areas, They've learned how to take care of themselves at an early age. They're terrific, therefore, entrepreneurs. Most of Silicon Valley is populated by these folks. But when they were young, they experienced the terrible uh, environment in which their parents were mostly absent. And that was captured by this movie. Now, it's a comedy, but I'm going to show you a clip that is not funny at all but nevertheless extraordinarily well captures the attitude of Generation X. And it's captured by the speech of Ferris Bueller's boyfriend, not of Ferris Bueller, but here they all are, trying to figure out how to make the speedometer go backwards on the dad's uh, fancy sports car, not the Alfa Romeo of graduate, but still a red sports car, um, that they've taken for a joyride. And so it's up on the stilts, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, with the engine running in reverse. I gotta take a stand. I'm bullshit. I put up with everything. My old man pushes me around. Well, he's not the problem, I'm the problem. I gotta take a stand. I gotta take a stand against him. I am not gonna sit on my ass. The events that affect me unfold to determine the course of my life. I'm going to take a stand. I'm going to defend it. Right or wrong, I'm going to defend it. I'm so sick of his shit. Who do you love? Who do you love? You love a car. 
father will come home and see what I did. I can't hide this. He'll come home, he'll see what I did, he'll have to deal with me. I don't care, I really don't. I'm just tired of being afraid. So, there's the anthem of Generation X. I have to take a stand, mostly against my old man who built a shrine to the car that he loves more than me, right? But I have to take a stand. It doesn't actually say what he's taking a stand in favor of. He's simply taking a stand against what his family, his father, the older generation is trying to uh, do and the way they behave. And how many of you have seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Yeah, I thought so. And for Xers, it's their favorite movie, believe me. So here's the age of Generation X today. Uh, they're a small generation. They came along at a time when people either didn't want kids or couldn't afford them. It was a time of roaring inflation. Mother and father had to work with double incomes to preserve their standard of living. Mother also had a new advantage of some technological advances in health sciences called the pill, and therefore that made it possible to be out of the house and in society as opposed to be staying at home. And therefore a lot of Gen Xers grew up. I won't ask in this room, I would do it in a different kind of setting in classrooms. Grew up as latchkey kids for the first time in American history. Children came home from school with a key around their neck to let themselves into the house because mother and father weren't going to be around until later, right? And in fact, the average time spent with a, an adult role model for Gen X fell from the previous historical norms of four or five hours back in my childhood days to 14 and a half minutes. And if you ask parents of Gen Xers like I was, well, how could you do that to your kid? The answer usually is, well, it wasn't a lot of time, but when I was with them, it was, I knew you knew the answer. <laughs> Try telling that to a young kid. Uh, nevertheless, social trends began to reverse. Gen Xers took more personal responsibility for their behavior. Their presidential hero was Ronald Reagan, so they're mostly conservative or apolitical. They're self-starting and very much individualist. And in the uh, great uh, Star Wars description of life on the planet and in the galactic universe, they are represented by the character Han Solo, whose last name is very important and whose job, of course, was as a bit of a renegade in the, in the uh, world of, of Star Wars, but one who ultimately helped the good guys triumph. And that's kind of the story of Xers. Not well thought of when they were young. I'll show you briefly here a magazine cover about them written by boomers that's really nasty, right? But now that they're in their 30s and 40s, they're pretty good folks, and they're helping a lot. And uh, they come with a whole set of pragmatic ideas that are completely different than boomers. But the subject of today's conversation is the millennials that follow and notice they're now back. We're starting the cycle over again. They're of a civic type, like Tom Brokaw's greatest generation and GI generation and the Republican generation. They are what many people feel is America's next great generation. Well, uh, Xers don't think so, but many millennials do. And because of the way they were raised, which we'll talk about briefly, they're very upbeat and optimistic and oriented uh, towards the group and the group's decisions. And of course, like civic generations before them, they're building new institutions, except that they're built around social networks. Think of Facebook, which is a millennial CEO, that are completely different than institutions of the types that older folks are familiar with and are often missed or ignored as a result of that, despite the huge importance they will play in America's future. So let's do one last clip before we get into millennials. Now, th now, th now watch. How many people saw Devil Wears Prada? 
So the girls raise their hand, okay. <laughs> and, um, and this is the coming of age movie for millennials, but since the men in the audience haven't seen this movie, uh, there's, uh, let me do a little quick setup. Uh, this is a father now visiting not the son but the daughter. That's important. Uh, millennials have the most gender neutral attitudes of any generation in history. So the distinction that Coach K made between having sons and daughters doesn't necessarily apply when the generation thinks about itself and what roles would be appropriate. But uh, what's happened here is that the daughter has gone to work for an absolute terror of a boss. Uh, fictionalized version of Vogue editor played by Meryl Streep and uh, she's just a gopher an assistant for this person and now she's trying to explain this all to her worried father yeah Nate said it was great mm -hmm. he actually he, he applied here but they wanted some of course here huh? what's this I don't want you to get behind me you rat how did you I'm gonna kill mom <laughs> It's really good to see you. You too, honey. So, you want to start grilling me now or should we wait till after dinner? Well, I thought I'd let you at least enjoy the bread basket first. No, 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 it's okay. Go right ahead. We're just a little worried, honey. We get emails from you at your office at 2 a.m. Your pay is terrible. You don't get to write anything. Yeah, that's not fair. I read those emails. I'm just trying to understand why someone who got accepted to Stanford Law turns it down to be a journalist, and now you're not even doing that. Dad, you have to trust me. Being Miranda's assistant opens a lot of doors. And Emily is going to Paris with Miranda in a few months, and she's going to meet editors and writers from every important magazine, and, and in a year that could be me. Right? Mm -hmm. I swear, this is my break. This is my, my chance. This is my boss. I'm sorry, Dad. I have to take this. Hello, Miranda? My flight has been canceled. It's some absurd uh, weather problem. I need to get home tonight. The twins have a recital tomorrow morning at school. What? At school! Absolutely. Oh. Let me see what I can do. Good. Hi. Um, uh, I know this is totally last minute, but I was hoping that you could maybe get a flight for my boss from Miami to New York tonight. Uh... So, a um, couple things to notice about that. Her father thinks that she should be pursuing a traditional career using credentials and education to get ahead in the world. And the millennial says, whose name is Andy, by the way, says, um, no, 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 it's all about networking. Look at the people I'm going to meet. Look at the connections I'm going to make. That's how I'm going to get ahead in the world. And this importance of staying connected and being networked is, in fact, how millennials think about careers and how to advance in the world. And it's not by credentials, again, that disdain for expertise. And so far, higher education has been a major disappointment in terms of its return on investment for this generation. And then, of course, you see this enormously different father-child relationship. First of all, the father's in the movie. Second of all, it's not the claustrophobic, domineering parents of the graduate. It's a supportive, here's some money to get you by, whatever you want to do is okay with me, even though I don't understand it, kind of parenting, right? So completely different uh, relationship. And of course, you also noticed how much the two of them got along, how well they got along, 
Uh, millennials love their parents, the love is reciprocated, and uh, there is no generational gap in uh, decision making here. So you'll see parents involved in millennials' career decisions in their job, just like they were involved in their school. They're not going away. Therefore, just a, one last visual and then we'll delve into millennials. Millennials aren't Xers. I don't know how many Xers we have in the room, but the reason you don't like millennials is they're not you, okay? That's basically <laughs> what you have to understand. And, and what I'm showing you there is a very famous magazine cover from 1990 in which, written by boomers, about this new up and coming Gen X generation. And it has some nasty stuff in the cover which you can't read about uh, whether the generation is, you know, just lost and besides which they're overshadowed by the boomers. It's, it's a magazine issue that most Xers ripped up. But it's pictorial portrayal of alienated, non-smiling, individualistic, dressed in black, young 20-somethings was an accurate capture of Gen X culture. And I only put it up there to so that you can see the comparison with the magazine cover, different national ma news magazine, but 10 years later, Newsweek, portraying the same age group. So it's not an age issue, it's a generational issue portraying the same age group now of millennials. And here, instead, we have group hugs, we have underwear hanging out, we got smiles, we got brightly colored clothes, all the things that say the group is the most important thing in our lives, and this is how we're going to live. And when Coach K talks about the importance of sharing and your own program for today has sharing on the cover, welcome to the world of millennials. Sharing is what, there is what they are about. This is just one quick slide to say that they're not only the most uh, pop, numerous uh, generation in American history, but also the most diverse up until the generation that follows them. Those are the color codes of the percentage of uh, non-white uh, populations by generation. You can see the very last uh, years, 2003, 2004, of the millennials is almost at 50%. It kept on going to where it is now, 50% non-white. And you can also see how very different that is from the predominantly white populations of older generations. But uh, this means that, you know, 40% of this generation are non-white, and one in five have an immigrant parent. So it's a very diverse generation. Raise this way. Okay, how many of you will admit to putting a baby on board sign, or used to have your child do that if you have grandchildren of that? Appeared in 1982 on minivans, the first car designed with the passenger in mind, and it's still out there on the road today carrying America's babies around, right? But the big thing was, I have a baby in my car, please be careful. To which most older people said, who cares? You know, I mean, <laughs> what's that about? Well, you don't understand, my baby is special. And so if you ask any millennial, if they're special, they will tell you they are special. And this is one of the annoying traits that people <laughs> sort of react to. And I heard Neil Howe explain this on a Fox News broadcast to a reporter who was obviously Gen X and who obviously had a lot of trouble with the millennials working for her. And uh, Neil gave some very good advice. He said, well, what are you getting all upset about just that they're, that they're, um, that they're special? Just tell them you agree that they're special and you have special things for, to do with them and for them, with them. Okay, uh, they're sheltered. That little toddler has got his uh, helmet on and his shoulder straps to go for a walk in the stroller. Um, we've gone through the biggest youth safety movement in America's history, Amber Alerts and all the rest of it, at a time when America has never been safer, particularly urban America, right? but that doesn't matter. Every one of these folks are precious and we can't lose a single one. They're confident and highly optimistic because of the way their parents told them every time they did something when they were young, nice job, never criticize, build up their self-esteem. And if they didn't think they were uh, uh, powerful when they elected a president of the United States in 2008 because millennials supplied most of President Obama's winning margin, they now felt for sure they knew that they were in charge of the world. 
They're team oriented, and you may have all noticed that if you have any of them working for you. You need to figure out how to leverage that team, just as Coach K did in his, in his video. Uh, they learned how to play as a team by watching Barney, not motivational videos of Coach K. Uh, Barney is a purple dinosaur, as different on the outside as he can be, but on the inside, he's just like you and me. <laughs> Bet you didn't think I knew that. All right. <laughs> they're, they're extraordinarily tolerant. They have a reputation in political circles as being liberal, but because they are tolerant on social issues, but they are mostly just tolerant. They just tolerate diversity. That's not necessarily their political philosophy. And they will work with teams very effectively, and they will not work very effectively um, on their own. They are the best achieve behave generation decades. Don't have time to show you the data. All the social trends are in the right direction now that millennials are young folks, young crime down to its record levels, lows, teenage pregnancies, that sort of thing, all in the right direction, all at record lows. But their parents not, didn't just tell them they were special. They also told them they expected great things from them. So they've been pushed to study hard, and therefore they avoid risk like the plague. The opposite of Gen Xers, who are all into risk and entrepreneurship. Millennials, if they take a risk and they fail, since life is a series of hoops to be jumped through, their life's over. If they don't get in the right preschool, they'll never get into a good college. So this is kind of a problem, right? And so if you want millennials to take risk and you're working with them, put them as a team. They don't have any problem with team failure. That's a competition. We can do that. Individual failure, not acceptable. Look for the least risk solution instantly. And last, they're conventional. They actually believe that social rules are important, right? So unlike the kind of Gen X theme of no rules, right, which a restaurant actually has as its slogan, no rules, then you go in there and there's a whole bunch of rules. But anyway, um, uh, this generation thinks rules are important because it helps the team get along. Now they will negotiate with you endlessly about the consequences of the rules, right? Which also drives people crazy. But you will not get in an argument with millennials about rules, and that's helpful. All of this I say to you, because I'm going to final 10 minutes here, want to talk about what it means, is important because by the end of this decade, more than one out of three Americans, adult Americans, will be millennials. So we're not talking about some small group that we can ignore it safely. In fact, you can't ignore them. They're everywhere, and they're taking over as they turn 18. So here's some quick rules for leadership and management, either in your organization, your own, or in sea change generally. First of all, yes, you've got to manage three generations. And I think that was pointed out earlier. With vastly different outlooks on life, from ideological to optimistic, great differences in their attitudes towards work. Millennials want work with meaning and purpose. You should take advantage of that. You have an enormous opportunity for recruitment here. They want to change the world for the better. You can show them a way to do that. But don't expect them to listen to you because you're in charge. That isn't going to happen, right? It doesn't even matter if you're the doctor and they're the patient. That ain't going to happen, right? They're going to call up their friends. They're going to go on the internet. They're going to search for answers. They're going to come back to you and say, what about this? What about that? Because they think the truth is a consensus of, the, of their peers, not a piece of expertise from somebody else. The good news is they're committed to success. The important thing to remember is that amongst millennials, Leaders are the people who can help the group arrive at a consensus. They're not the charismatic, individual, heroic figure that you think of as being a good leader. They're actually looking for somebody who listens very well and figures out how to get the whole group, just like in Barney, to find the right solution that, may, that is, in consultant speak, a win-win solution for everybody. So what you have as a challenge, as every leader does today, is how to take the inspiration, motivation, and values of the boomer generation that many of you understand because it's a part of you. Blended with the creativity, risk-taking, and bottom-line orientation of Generation Xers, and then bring in the millennials for their tremendous dedication to team, 
their enormous technological capabilities and their desire for everybody to find a consensus. And I'm basically, as I said at the beginning, just echoing Coach K's world here. So here's some ways to do that. Since millennials are optimistic and looking for win-win solutions and want to change the world, you need to inspire innovation with vision and values and create loyalty through meaning and purpose. When millennials, working age millennials, not young millennials, were asked who their ideal employers were, the traditional technology companies got the top three spots. In fourth place was the State Department. In sixth place was the FBI. And the one that drives boomers crazy in ninth place was the CIA, okay? This is a generation that wants to change the world and, is, does, and believes that institutions can be vehicles for making those changes. You run those kinds of institutions. You need to be strong on your values, strong in your inspiration to attract them. And then you need to th do like they do, which is think globally but act locally. And we talked about sharing already and consensus decision making. So let me just focus in these final couple minutes on thinking globally and acting locally. When millennials see a problem, they think the way to solve it is in their local community. Not necessarily their local physical community. It could be a local virtual community on social networks. But they, want, they think that the way you change the world is not by starting at the top and organizing a mass movement or a cause. It's by banding together as individuals, finding a solution that works, implementing that solution, making an example, sharing it, and have the snowball start rolling. And of course, they do that all on the edge of things. So here's uh, some data which I won't go over, but the share of college graduates I think is important who believe their community is more important than their job doubled between the time Xers were in college and the time millennials were in college, the single largest shift in basic values in freshman surveys between the two generations. And 70% of entering freshmen in 2009 said it was essential or very important to help people in need. 85% of them considered voluntary community service as an effective way to solve the nation's problems, not the community's problems, the nation's problems. You have to leverage that attitude in the work you do. And last, these are some of the institutions they're building. You probably haven't heard of the Harry Potter Alliance, but it has 10,000 members of Double Doors Army who are real people, right, who grew up on Harry Potter and are actively involved through online and offline action in environmental causes. I won't go through all of them. I want to talk very briefly and pointedly about the Energy Action Coalition. This is a group of 25 millennial uh, nonprofits who decided that they were going to reject the personality-driven, uh, siloed approach to global warming that their boomer uh, elders had created, things like the Sierra Club and the National Resource Defense Council and organizations like that. Each of one founded around the idea and power of the values of their founding peop, uh, leaders who developed an approach, whether it's through lobbying or not, or through grassroots or whatever, to how they sustain themselves in a business model that's individual to the organization. The millennials running these 25 organizations rejected that entire structure. And instead, they got together and had a very long three-day workshop on what it is that each of them did best in their local community. And then they all worked with each other to figure out how much money they needed to continue that work. And then all 25 of them went to the grant giving organizations in the environmental world, because it's all about global warming really, and made one proposal and said, if you give us this money, we figured out how to spend it to make sure that whoever spends the money does the most effective job at it. You're not gonna get 25 requests from us, you're gonna get one. And of course, they've been enormously successful because there's nothing that grant giving organizations like better than a solution to the competing demands that they receive every day. So think about that as a millennial challenge for all of the organizations in Sea Change on how Sea Change could be, in fact, an example of how to significantly impact the fundraising side of this world 
by operating as if you were the Energy Action Coalition. My message is, and you've heard it before, but I'll underline it, you need to be prepared for change. It will happen to you in your workplace. It is already happening in your workplace. If you're good enough to hire millennials, please hire some more highest unemployment rates of any generation, and their parents will love you for it. Uh, in fact, they'll help you with their work, if you're ready for that. Um, be prepared for how you relate to people who are outside the medical profession when they're all millennials. Be ready to be challenged on your expertise. Be ready to be involved in community decision making and consensus. And of course, look for a revolution in philanthropy from a generation dedicated to changing the world. A lot of them out there in Silicon Valley are trust babies and they've got some money to give, but they're doing it in ways that are considerably different and when the generation eventually makes its way in society and earns the money, it, it will. You will see a complete revolution in how uh, giving is, uh, is done in this country. Hopefully that gives you some ideas on how to deal with the millennials. We've got a great panel for further discussion. Get ready, millennial momentum is on its way. Can you hear me? All right. I'm Tom Keene. Nice to see everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Morley, for a great presentation. Although my uh, inherent guilt uh, as a boomer generation probably went up by about 50%, uh, thinking that somehow we made all this happen, right? Um, there you go. And I do remember where I was with JFK. And I remember the wonderful world when all you wanted to do if you wanted to talk to everybody was get something on TV. Okay, doesn't work like that anymore. Anyway, thank you very much for that. That very helpful and very thought-provoking. I kept thinking as I was listening to, to Morley about the fact that uh, the millennials are not only the generation that's coming in, if you will, into our workforce and into ultimately the leadership roles, but if we're interested in societal change, which all of our initiatives are about, the question is how do you change that group of people, particularly if it's as large as we, we heard about. So I have a wonderful panel here to join us, and uh, I'd like to ask you all to come up on the stage. Uh, I'm going to introduce you while you're, you're walking up here. Um, we have with us this morning uh, four great folks, as well as uh, Morley, uh, Nancy Dickey, uh, who is the president of the Texas A&M Health Science Center and also vice chancellor uh, for health affairs for the Texas A&M University System. Uh, she's a former dean of the uh, Texas A&M College of Medicine. Uh, she was the first woman elected to the uh, elected as president of the American Medical Association, and in 2007 she was elected to the Institute of Medicine. Uh, Jason Denby uh, is a new friend to Sea Change. Welcome, Jason. And um, he served as an intern in President Bush's office while attending Texas A&M, where he went to school. And after college, Jason came to D.C. as a briefing coordinator for uh, Secretary Tommy Thompson. Uh, and from there, he went on to the, uh, with, secretary, with the secretary to the Aiken uh, Gump Group, where he serves as a senior policy specialist. He became interested in uh, cancer issues as a result of his grandmother being diagnosed. And he's become very active in cancer advocacy and fundraising. And uh, we're pleased to have him involved with us. Kenya Johnson is here with us this morning from the Lance Armstrong Foundation. She's their vice president of programs. Uh, for the five years before joining Lance Armstrong, the Lance Armstrong Foundation. She's a program, program and training specialist with the Texas Department of Health Services. She also spent three years working with the American Cancer Society uh, in the Austin area and uh, was Associate Dean of Student Affairs and Director of Human Development at Houston Tillotson College. And Bill Novelli, uh, who is a distinguished professor at the, uh, that's a title and an ad, ad, adjective, adverb, whatever that word is. Um, Bill is truly a distinguished professor at uh, Georgetown University's uh, McDonough School of Business. He's uh, currently serving as co-chair and a driving force behind the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, uh, which we are also a part of, and as, as he is a part of Sea Change. Uh, and they're dedicated to reforming advanced care illness by empowering consumers, changing the healthcare delivery system, and improving policies 
to enhance uh, provider capacity. Uh, Bill has been a great partner with Sea Change on our value initiative. He also served an eight-year term as CEO of AARP. Uh, he was president of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, and prior to that, he was executive vice president of CARE, and um, both for U.S. and uh, operations uh, and abroad. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Bill first in 1975, and uh, I've learned a lot from him over the years, just as I've learned from each of these. We look forward to having a good conversation. So I'm not going to start with you, Morley. I'll give you a chance to Thank you. Set, settle down there. But Nancy, maybe we could start with you. I guess one of the questions I'd want is just based on what you heard, what's your sort of first reaction to the notion of this next generation or this millennial generation who's moving into our space? And you see you're surrounded by them every day, I guess, right? Yes, I am. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think that one of the things uh, that's throughout the morning has been the discussion of we better be ready for change. Uh, that, that shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us. But in healthcare, we've begun talking uh, a lot about really needing to change the way we deliver health care. And a great deal of what Morley had to say is perhaps a little bit uh, optimistic. Uh, they like uh, teamwork. Uh, they don't have a lot of respect. Now, I am a doctor, so this is going to be hard to say, but um, <clears throat> they don't have a lot of respect for just because I'm the doctor. So interdisciplinary care may actually have a future uh, that my generation probably is going to uh, trip over um, going forward. Uh, it's going to change other things, too, though. When these folks come into my office, uh, I have to assume that uh, they think they have as much expertise as I have, and that changes the interaction. But as we talk about a healthier population and the importance of uh, individual patients and society taking more responsibility so that physicians, nurses, other healthcare providers don't have to uh, be responsible for the outcomes, again, it's, a, it's kind of an optimistic message. So the question is, can those of us in current leadership roles get our arms around the changes we have to make to quickly take advantage of what they may bring? I think that's a really great question, a really great point. So uh, nothing against Nancy and, and uh, Morley and myself and Bill, but the next two people are a little more closer to the millennial generation. You may be among them. I don't know. Uh, you can self-admit if you want. Uh, Jason, what's your thoughts after hearing you, uh, Morley initially? Well, I, um, I, I read a part of your book the other day, and um, I, it, it, it kind of answered everything that I understood about myself. I mean, I'm right on the cusp. I am actually mostly a millennial. And um, it's funny because my partner is actually um, a Gen Xer on the, the older side of it. And I realize now these differences that we have <laughs> yeah. in life good luck, are good luck based on everything that you talk about. <laughs> but I, I, as, I, as I, I moved to DC right after I graduated from Texas A&M, and I came here thinking I was going to like work at HHS, I'd go work on the Hill affect all this change, and I saw that DC didn't work that way. And I, I worked very briefly for a senator, and I was astonished when I got a call and said, the senator has to vote this way. And I was like, well, shouldn't he decide how he wants to vote? You know, and they're like, no, if, you know. And I realized all of my friends, and eventually me, we've all been going into positions now where we can actually affect policy and change through nonprofits and through other types of things, so. Yeah. I think it's a very important observation. It gets right to the heart of what you just asked. Are we, we uh, able to make those changes? Because the next generation's expecting them. Yeah. Can so for me, I am five weeks into the job at the Lance Armstrong Foundation, and I find myself surrounded by millennials. And I can think back to the interview process, and one of them, we're going back to what we talked about earlier in terms of you, you can't tell them. They're, they're, you're, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna influence them. They're gonna kinda tell you. And so at one of the uh, interviewees, who's somebody that I manage now, says, we don't need a manager. We don't need a supervisor. That's not what we're looking for. We pretty much need someone that's gonna support us and our, our ideas. And so it kind of took, I, I took it back and said, oh, okay then. And so now, <laughs> in these five weeks, I'm watching my team flourish. They're doing all of the things that they want to do. They got mom, that's right. what they were looking for. <laughs> you know? I'm a generation Xer, and so I do, I, I do see that there is some overlap, but then other times I'm just kind of sitting back like, okay, let me, let me, let me see what you can do. And, and they're awesome at doing it. They have all of these great ideas that sometimes the other generations we're not thinking of. So going back to the boomers, or somewhere <laughs> in that vicinity, Bill? 
Well, um, first of all, I, I love Morley's talk. I was fascinated with it, and I, and I liked reading the report. And of course, from my AARP days and other places, I've done a lot of work in this area. Uh, but I want to be a little bit of a contrarian, and I can explain myself later if you want to talk about it. Um, while generational analysis is fascinating, um, I don't think we should put all of our eggs in that basket. Um, but the second thing I'll say just about the millennials is that um, uh, when you look at uh, the description that Morley gave us, um, there's great cause for optimism, I think. But at the same time, I think there's problems ahead. Uh, not just with millennials, but with the country, and therefore with millennials. Um, you know, the after effects of the recession have been really lousy. It's really had an effect on work. It's going to affect them for perhaps half or more of their work lives. Um, we've got a terrible K through 12 educational system. So this idea that they're the best educated generation uh, is called into question in many ways. And the one behind them is really, I think, having problems. The dropout rate is stubborn and difficult to deal with. When we talk about risk factors, and that's a key part of sea change, um, risk factors are, are getting worse and not better in this country in many ways. Uh, and when you add all this stuff together and you look at, at other national problems, uh, we see problems on the horizon. So uh, I would um, just want to make sure I didn't say the wrong thing in that chart. The educational results of millennials are the best. NAAP scores and so forth continue to rise. I completely agree with Bill that they're trapped in a horrible system that isn't delivering the kinds of education we're going to need to be successful. I would add that's true at the higher education level as much as it's true at K-12. Today's higher education system costs too much and delivers too little. We burdened a generation with student debt the first time in American history that we've ever asked a generation to self-finance the educational achievements that the country's economy demands. This is an unheard of intergenerational problem, right? But they are the best, they, they do know more, let me say it that way, than other generations, at least according to all the tests that are being administered. The other thing I would say is there's a slide up there that we went over quickly about the best of each generation and the challenge is how to blend it. Strauss and Howe say that each generation in American life in this cycle comes along to deliver exactly what the society needs at the moment they appear. So we needed the values and the refreshment of society that boomers brought into a world, into a society that was kind of stultified and, and conformist and difficult to move, right? GIs, if you watch them on Mad Men, aren't easy to move, right? And so that was needed. We also needed the extra reaction against too much rhetoric, not enough doing. Let's get on with things. Let's get to the bottom line. And now we need the millennials optimism because the problems that, that Bill talked about are very real. The difference is when you ask millennials about them, after they acknowledge the problems, they express the greatest amount of optimism that we're going to fix all those things. Mm -hmm. And if you ask them how, they'll say, well, we'll take care of it, right? right? I mean, we, we, we always done a nice job. We'll do it again. Our parents told us we did. And so that level of optimism <laughs> is also exactly what the country needs at this moment when so many people are pessimistic about its future. So um, let's, let's flip this towards sea change now. We, we've sort of got this <laughs> sort of. We have these six strategic initiatives. They're all about foundational change in society. We're not trying to do one-year projects here. We're doing things that are going to take 10 years. And you're telling us that I think one in three people at the end of that 10-year cycle is going to be a millennial. Correct. Right. So if we think about that, the question would be is how does that impact our thinking or how should it impact our thinking with regard to the way we approach our initiatives? I mean, we've got goals and targets that we're, going to, we, we're leaving here with. We brought them in. We'll leave with them. But it's now execution time, and what does that difference make? So I wonder if I can put you on the spot, Jason, and just how would you see us, see us as an organization, and see, how would you see that generation impacting the way we can impact change? I feel like the best way is to, you know, I'm, I'm 
very interested in sea change and other organizations. So I actively go and seek and try to learn and find out what the strategies are and what the what outcomes they want. But I feel like for for millennials, if that's what you want to get into, is you have to kind of make it a little simpler for them to understand, or where they can go. I can go onto my iPhone and my my you know thing, and it's all right there. It's all mobile friendly, and I can. You know, I can push a button right there, text if I want to donate $50. I can, you know, if I can put it on my Facebook page and just kind of like, you know, and I do think sometimes like our parents, my parents always like told me how to do things. And sometimes I need to have it right there in front of me, very basic, and then let us use our creativity to go out and explore it with friends. So, but you came to us and sat down with us and talked to us. Yes. Yeah. So you're telling me that another way to have gotten to you quicker, better, maybe faster. Well, I, I, I laughed. I, well, I have to say real quick, and I, I, um, I started off by interning in President Bush's office in Houston, I think two years, and it was a completely unpaid and, and fun time, and I sometimes skipped class so I could work a little extra because it was fun. And my parents thought I was, no disrespect, thought I was nuts because, you know, I was like driving to Houston like th two days a week. and. Um, and then I could kind of relate to the, the, the Devil Wears Prada. Yeah. When I worked for Secretary Thompson, I mean, there were many times where I, you know, I've lost dates, I've lost a lot of things, because that's what, how my life was. But I'm now sitting here in, in front of you all, and I've, I've learned stuff, and I'm networking, and I, it all turns into, into something. Well, let me just say, for the benefit of all of you, as, since you are among, close to that generation, if not right on the cusp, <laughs> Uh, Jason's uh, came in, sat down for about a half an hour with us, and then started spilling off people he knows that would be connections for us to, that we didn't have to be able to start work with these folks. And it was an astonishing sort of quick learning, quick study, and then boom, I have there's some ideas for you. Not afraid to put them out there. I probably didn't express a real idea until I was about 37. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, and I appreciate that, but it is a very different model. And uh, even with my own grandkids, I will tell you, they are every day telling me how the world works. And, uh, and I need to get with it. <laughs> Kenya, what about you? In a loving way. In a loving way. Yeah. Absolutely in a loving way. Yeah. I, I would agree, and, and, and just looking at the, the biggest picture here, what can millennials provide? So then, you, you, like you said, the whole Facebook thing, you, you want to be able to reach them where they are. So in, in, in ensuring that you have those tools, so I'm, I'm thinking of the team that I work for now, or work with now, there are so many things that they are providing, just the whole upfront thing, our patient navigation center. So someone diagnosed with cancer. They can come into the facility, but not a lot of people are doing that. They're actually reaching out to us online. They're looking more globally at, okay, well, I'm not a cancer patient right now. I'm not a survivor, but I'm a caregiver. What are some things that I can do now? Can I go ahead and give via Facebook? Can I go ahead and do, we're doing videos. Today is, is, is Live Strong Day, and there are over a million videos that are, go, that are streaming right now that are talking about ways that they can, this whole cancer burden, what can they do around that? And I think that's important. That's what millennials want to see. Okay, what can I, is, is there a Twitter feed? Is there a Facebook feed? Is there an app for that? <laughs> you know, every, you, there's an app for everything. Like you said, how can I donate? Can, what can I push on my iPhone or my iPad and give instantly? Or how can I just, just give back to the community so quickly? Because remember, everything, they want it quick. They want to do it right now. And we need to make sure that we're providing that, that for them. Bill? Well, I, um, Dr. Duke this morning mentioned that she teaches millennials, and I do as well, but my sample size is small. I'm talking about MBAs. Mm. So um, when, I, when I work with these MBAs, um, what I see is exactly what you were talking about, uh, a generation that's enormously tech savvy. Uh, it befuddles me. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, they're very entrepreneurial. Now, in my day, we weren't entrepreneurial. My dad said, you know, get a job with a big company, climb the ladder. Um, but I will say that the most entrepreneurial people in the country are people 50 and older. So you see what Morley was talking about, this, this business about generations maybe emulating themselves in recurring cycles. Uh, they're very smart and confident, and one of the things I like best is they're looking for social relevance and not just a bottom line, even though they are MBAs. And one of the things I think is really important as we look at the strategic initiatives of sea change, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, risk reduction, uh, assuring value in cancer care. I think it's really important not just to think about generations, 
but to think intergenerationally. So, for example, whenever we hear that millennials are respectful of their elders, when you talk to older people, this so-called silent generation or, the, or the, uh, you know, the World War II generation, what do they want? What they want is they want a country that's better for their kids and their grandkids and their great-grandkids. And so there's no intergenerational strife in this country. The generations are really glued together. And we need to think not just about how we can segment according to a generation, but how we can work across generations, because therein lies great power. Yeah. You know, I want to just follow up on that, Bill, because I think that's a really important point in thinking about, so, so we want to change society. You, want to, you and we want to change society around this advanced care issue, and in our case, palliative and hospice care specifically. <laughs> And uh, to do that, we can't just talk to one group of people at a time, one generation. We do have to continue that thread. We're talking to all of society. I think we focused on millennials today because it turns out they are the group that is the biggest group coming, and they're coming into positions where we're going to deal with them differently. Nancy, any thoughts? Well, it dawns on me as I listen. Uh, we, uh, I, certainly Bill and I, I, I think, sit in the positions uh, Maybe, maybe we're the bookends here uh, that uh, uh, are in leadership positions, but I think we better be listening to <clears throat> some of the messages both that you delivered and that we're hearing uh, from uh, Kenya and, and uh, some Jason. Thank you. Uh, and so how do we get the energy directed at sea change that you heard about for the 25 not-for-profits that decided they were going to go out and have an impact on energy in this country? Uh, how do we begin to use that immediacy and uh, community orientation to really grow the community level team to talk about both prevention and end of life care? Uh, our generation, I think, has a tendency to think about finding a solution up here and hope that it somehow trickles down. Right. And I think what we're hearing is, go ahead and have some ideas up here, but we'll help you you know, grow it up, if you will. If we in this room don't take advantage of that energy, a decade from now, um, many of us will be retired or moved on someplace else, and uh, we will have missed 10 years of potentially putting these folks in a position to uh, really get that ball moving forward, so. I think those comments are very important. Actually, all of them are. Uh, I didn't have time to get into detail on one of the bullets that said drive decision-making to the edge as opposed to the center. This sort of follows along with the skepticism about expertise and the nature of social media networks. And you heard uh, both uh, Jason and Kenya talk about getting stuff done quickly, easily, in virtual worlds, without a lot of hierarchy and bureaucracy. That's part of moving decision-making to the edge. But also what, um, what both Bill and Nancy talked about, which is finding ways to accomplish the same goal, but assuming that it's not going to be accomplished by critical thinking in a boardroom somewhere, but rather by trial and error in the field of practice itself that's incentivized and encouraged and supported, and the learning is extracted from the experience and shared but it's not learning that's imposed or dictated. That's it, a really big difference with millennials. Is it fair to say that in that learning then, and, and I don't remember which of the slides talked about flexibility, but uh, we have a tendency, I'm thinking of all the things going on at CMS and other places today, we're going to do a pilot project, we're going to take the data back, and we're going we're to crunch it eight different ways, and then hopefully we'll go out and kind of remodel the pilot. And, and you're suggesting that, I think, um, we'll go out in the field, we'll, we'll be processing data every day as we're doing whatever we do, and those modifications need to be made much like driving a car. Correct. Um, you, you just can't... Real time. Yeah, you're, you're not driving five miles down the road, you're driving in real time and, and making decisions. And you have to build in the sharing mechanisms into that process so that the trial and error doesn't result in the same error five times. Now wait right? a minute, I'm the boss, okay? <laughs> also important that we make sure we give our millennials credit. 
Remember how we talked about earlier with the different stages. So here you have this millennial that's traveling with the parents and seeing, I'll use the example, I'm thinking of the end of life care, traveling with their parents to, their, to see their grandparents who are in this hospice facility. And that millennial is in that atmosphere and they're thinking, well, okay, that worked 10 years ago, but maybe this is some things that I can change while I'm here. Oh, I see that they're not really reaching out to the family like they could, or I see so many different opportunities. Maybe there is you know, a feed that we can get here. I, I'm visiting, I can't come and see my grandfather at this facility, but when I'm at home or when I'm working, maybe there's a feed that I can So I think the millennials' mind is always working as they're investigating all of the different stages of life and when, when they're with those other generations. I think they're just kind of a sponge, just soaking it all in and thinking about not only can I, I'm an innovator, but I can also make sure that, you know, kind of oil this wheel that's been working, but I'm going to shine it up a bit. It's an interesting, uh, so, so I'm going to just put, the, put it all on the table right now, I suppose. So Sea Change was created with the idea that let's get the leaders of the big cancer organizations in the room. Let's ask the question of what needs to be done or what's going undone that we can do, okay? And, uh, and now we have a model that's, that we've heard in several different ways today that thinks about how do we look at the world differently than the old boardroom model or the old top-down model because we have a group of people and a technology now and networking networks we never had before. So what does that say for us to us as leaders of organizations and as a collection of leaders about how we need to change in order to accommodate that. So you said right at the beginning, Nancy, I think one of the problems is we may be the problem or we may be intransigent to the changes that are needed. What, what does it look like to make those changes? Be, I mean, before Nancy answers, I just want to say how important Coach K's message was to the question you just asked. I mean, this is a guy who coaches millennials to, to outstanding performance, right? And a lot of the examples he talked about was actually a Gen X millennial blend on the Olympic team because you got Kobe Bryant, the classic Xer, and you've got LeBron James, the classic millennial, who decided he wanted to play basketball with his friends, and so he brought him to Miami, right? Completely <laughs> threw open the NBA, what the hell is that, right? We don't, you can't do that. Um, and what he said was, and what he was encouraging all of us here was, play for the team in order to be better. The two acting as one is more powerful. Those are messages millennials would understand and kind of might help see change see its way clear to how to take that natural tendency on the part of the younger generation and bring it to bear with that in ways that older generations can support. I'm sorry. No, no, it's quite all right. And just for everybody, uh, he didn't say it today. It's one of the things we talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago down at Duke. But he said when we started talking about this, we were going to have this millennial conversation. One of the things that Coach K said was that um, I have to change my coaching style and my management style every four years. Mm -hmm. Every four years. And he says, I've had to do that since I became a coach because each four years he has a whole new crop of people. And uh, I, I thought about that as a, an object lesson for all of us who have sort of learned certain models of how to, to lead and behave. I'm speaking about myself. Uh, and thinking about, well, what are the changes that I have to personally make? But I also think now about the question of what organizationally do we do differently in order to accommodate that kind of thinking. And I know it, it first started my thinking was around the technology changes, which like you, I'm, you know, if I didn't have poor, poor Bryant uh, to help me out, or Brian to help me out, Brian Alexander uh, to help me out, I'd, I'd never worked my way through the technology. Well, O'Brien, you got to stop telling me the first thing is the plug is the plug in. Um, you got that part? Yeah, I got that part. I'm I'm ready to go go further. But but my point is, I started thinking about technology, but but it's every bit about the way we think and the way that the generation thinks. So, what do you think about sea change, and the model that we have, and the model that maybe we need to move towards? What changes would you make? Well, I I'd just like to say that um, you know Nancy is so right on um, about this business of. Um, you know, top-down isn't the answer. But I don't think any of us in this, in this room ever thought top-down was the answer. Right. We always thought, I believe, that we've got to push from the top-down, and you've got to build from the bottom-up. 
that's why so many of us are into community-based work and uh, grassroots work and so forth. I mean, I think that model still exists, and now it's a bigger, better model than ever because of social media, because of the kinds of ideas that the uh, millennials bring. And I want to, um, I want to talk about a, um, a particular issue that relates to your to see changes uh, work in assuring value in cancer care. And that's the boomer generation. So the boomers are 48 to 66 years old. So they are caregivers. They're taking care of their elderly parents and other loved ones. And they're staring their own mortality in the face. And as Morley said, they're a feisty generation. They're not going to stand for what's been going on, re being recycled through the emergency room, through the ICU, through the hospital, over and over again. So therein lies real opportunity. But I don't think that sea change or any of us should just focus on boomers. Right. We should think to ourselves, millennials care about their grandparents. We just right. heard that. And so what we need to do is we need to ba basically figure out how to get all generations working on change. If we do that and work from the bottom up and the top down, I think we've got some real opportunities. Amen. Okay. I'm still learning the whole the, the, the sea change and, and the whole sea change atmosphere and how that information is communicated. So I'm, I'm interested to see how that kind of unfolds. Um, I would like to see more technology if that doesn't exist, especially as we look at our workforce and look at um, who we're inviting to these meetings. Because although there is a limited number of millennials here this year, there might not be that it might not be that way for next year. Um, so we want to really look at um, and how we just get our overall message out, how we work on those priorities, how are they exhibited to the community, how can we get that information? Uh, one of the things that. Coach K was trying to demonstrate in that last video that he showed that we had the privilege of watching that he didn't underline, but I heard from Tom, he didn't use video before. No. This was the first time he'd ever done that, right? But he realized something that's also important about that millennial generation he was trying to coach. They see things in pictures. They do not see things in text. Writing out memos is not a favorite thing or even anything they will do well at, right? But PowerPoint, video even better, go for it, right? PowerPoint is becoming obsolete now. It's exactly, so exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. I was going to give you a PowerPoint, right? But at least it's got to be visual if you want to communicate with them. And the technology that Bill just mentioned, or, or, I'm sorry, it may have been Kenya, uh, we all come together for this meeting. Millennials say, why do you do that? Why aren't we all in some chat room with video everywhere and involving hundreds more people? Now, I'm not advocating. Uh, there's some things to be said in favor of concentrated meetings and personal interaction and careful decision making. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. But there are a lot of technological solutions to expanding the conversation that sea change could employ. And maybe there's a combination of the two. All right. There, there's a great deal to be said for these kinds of meetings. The, the networking we've talked about, right. the uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, to share ideas, get to know people from other organizations. But there are opportunities then to have either uh, adjacent to these kinds of meetings or separate from, uh, where you can get tremendous large groups of people uh, spread across many more communities uh, because you use the uh, uh, technology to do that as long as you've got the staff to figure out how to do that. Because like you, I'm just as well, plug it in. Millennials need the work, so hire them for the time. <laughs> well, and I also, I think, uh, both for Sea Change and for all of your individual organizations when it comes to fundraising and awareness, there, I mean, increasingly every day, there are more organizations out there, young professionals. I was just in New York two months ago and the, the Komen um, affiliate of the Young Professionals filled the entire rink of uh, Rockefeller Center for a, a cocktail hour that everybody paid $75 for. And not only did they raise the money, they also then got the awareness out. Everybody that was visiting Rockefeller Center saw all the pink. They were learning about it. And I, I just feel like there's a lot of ways you can, I mean, my, when my grandmother was diagnosed with breast cancer, she died. Um, but if she would have been alive now, thanks to all the work of all of you, she would be here still. And so y'all are amazing doctors, scientists, researchers, but I really think you should let the millennials kind of take away the awareness and fundraising part and really showcase what you're doing. So, so um, 
<laughs> Nancy, did you want to add anything on that? Okay. So, so I guess as we think about this, um, Bill, you used the term social relevance a little while ago. So there's no question that the issues we've changed are socially relevant. They're also economically relevant. And, uh, and, uh, and certainly at a time when they're important to our history. So I guess I'd want to just spend just a minute about this social relevance thing. Um, as a boomer, we got interested in social relevance. And I was telling Nancy this morning some early experiences I had working with uh, young people in the, in the valley uh, in Texas, uh, looking into health professions and some of the challenges they faced being migrant workers and being afraid to leave to better themselves because they were taking away a breadwinner from their family environment, et cetera. So I'm, so I'm very empathetic with the relevance uh, connection for us. So the, so the question for me with the making these socially relevant issues to the millennial generation is if you want to carry the ball, and I think that's kind of what you were saying, is let us carry the ball at the bottom up level while we're trying to also do things at the top level. What are some of the main triggers to make that make our stuff socially relevant in a world where there's a lot of different socially relevant things happening? How do we cut through the clutter? Have a millennial do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the traits, and Bill alluded to the social relevance that you're talking about. Social entrepreneurship is another catchphrase these days, very popular amongst MBA students. Uh, and Bill talked about engaging in enterprise in order to advance uh, the cause of humanity or the, improve the world, not just to make money, but money is still part of it. Uh, so that whole social entrepreneurship provides an opportunity for sea change to find new allies and make the work you do relevant. There's also one other very important thing. We've touched upon it a couple times. One of, the reason that millennials are raised differently is that all of their parents thought that they wanted to be friends with their children. This is not an idea that comes naturally to boomers and thinking about their parents, right? But rather than the boomer, my house, my rules kind of mentality, they engaged in a discussion about rules and consequences and they watched Bill Cosby raise his kids and the Huxtable family. <laughs> and they said, oh, okay, so there is a way of doing this. We can avoid physical discipline and we can still have a legitimate disciplinary conversation with our children, and afterwards they'll still like us. And that's where I wanted to go. If you, and it's, it's to Jason's uh, a very poignant com comment about his grandmother. Millennials don't want to see any harm come to anyone, particularly the people they love. And they love their parents, not just their grandparents. Grandparents, everybody loves, that's easy. Parents, a little harder, right? <laughs> and and in that respect, to the degree that you can appeal to that generation's sensibility about improving the lives and preventing harm coming to their parents as well as their grandparents, you've got a tremendously social relevant uh, cause to bring to millennials that wouldn't have worked with Xers who, you know, got their own life to live and that sort of thing, uh, but will definitely work with millennials and their relationship with their families. You know, Tom, excuse me now. No, it's okay. um, you know, here we are coming up on the presidential election, the congressional elections, and there are all these big ideological clashes that are going on. Social relevance may not even be a good term. One of the clashes basically is the idea that um, we've got to fix things as a society. We've got social responsibilities and we've got social relevance that we have to think about. And on the other side is the concept of personal responsibility. You know, if you smoke, it's your own damn fault. You know, that kind of concept. Or I built it myself. I made this company by myself. And, and um, therein lies uh, gridlock, partisan gridlock. Um, we've got to get past that. And when it comes to cancer control and it comes to sea change and, and the work that many of us are doing, um, it's really not a question of which side of that aisle that you're on. Everybody has a personal story, it's like the one we just heard, or the one that you talked about. And so um, one of the things we can do, I think, with, with the millennials and with, with all of us, is to, is to get our policymakers to understand this is not about ideological fights. 
uh, as Coach K said this morning, you know, we've got a war against disease. We've got to do something about these risk factors. You know, we're never going to get to cost containment in healthcare if we don't get to wellness right. and well-being. Right. We just can't keep patching these things. And so we have to work our way past social relevance versus personal responsibility, these other things. And I think that if we tell the right stories and we tell them to our policymakers in the right way, all generations, we can do that. You brought up a great point because I'm a, I'm a big storyteller. I think that's important. I think that's, how, that's how people are attached to a particular issue from their story. And so just hearing that, I think that's an important piece that we miss out on. And that, that's, a, that's a definite thing that we need to bring back, especially as we look, about, look at how we're just expanding the whole realm of cancer care in general. Um, in the whole, just, just all of the different pieces connected to that, that story, that's something that we need. If, if we're not doing that, we need to bring that back. Nancy? Well, as we look at the, the six strategies, I, I get, we, we've talked a fair amount already about um, sea change and how we should perhaps take advantage of the millennial uh, perspective and, and energy. I, and to the degree that, that you're the voices that we've uh, put here to perhaps uh, uh, help speak for the millennials, I think part of the question might be um, if, if we could leap 10 years ahead, how do you perceive that sea change's leadership might be attacking the problem of eradication, prevention, eradication, um, differently than we are today? Uh, and, and maybe what we can do is shorten some of the time frames uh, because currently most of the millennials are our workforce. Uh, but the numbers suggest that very soon the millennials are likely to be uh, not only our leaders but maybe some of our bosses. So you know, what, what would you perceive if the millennials were in charge they would do differently uh, with Sea Change's mission and strategies? Well, right now we would be streaming this. <laughs> right, right. We will be streaming this and people will be participating globally, looking in, you know, on their computer, on their iPhone. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is they would, millennials would, would, for example, talking to a doctor. We spoke last night about how there is, millennials don't believe in HIPAA. Everything is, everything is just out there. Nothing is private anymore. So they're going to put on Facebook how they just went to chemotherapy and this is what's happening. And then you're going to have 500, 500 other people chime in. And then when they realize, I'll use the guy as an example from UT, the uh, guy that started Texas 4000. He said, you know what, there's nothing out there for me. Let me go ahead and, and, and I'm going to create this. I'm going to ride my bike with a few friends and now look at the organization today. So millennials take a look at what needs to happen and then they go forward. If it's not out there, they're going to go in and they're going to create it. We as Sea Change need to tap into that. So bringing the millennials in, like I said, this year is just a few, next year it might be more. And actually maybe having a breakout session with millennials and finding out What's important to you? How, how do you see this organization changing and meeting the needs of you and your peers? Or your new, because they're going to create them, they're going to create those agencies. A guy in Chicago I visited last week, he said when he was going through treatment, he couldn't call anybody, he couldn't talk to anybody, there was no one out there. So guess what? He created this agency. So people like him are doing the same thing. So they're going to be at our table next year and in the years to come, and we need to figure out how we can best, as sea change, as how we can support them. I agree. Um, I you actually said everything I okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, I do think, I don't know if you have this meeting every year if it's in D.C. or is it elsewhere? But We have uh, moved it around in the past. But I think, like, like she said, um, even have something as simple as, like, a coffee. When you're in D.C. and you have all, you know, you have, bring staff in from the Hill from both sides of the aisle. You know, it's a big millennial different. town. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, there's a lot of people that, like, I, I mean, I went to A&M, I graduated right as she was coming in, and I thought she was a celebrity. You were still <laughs> but I mean, like, people, like, you are, you, for people that are interested in these issues, you are all celebrities to us. And it, it's great to rub shoulders and, and listen and talk, whether it be live streaming or, you know, in a conference room. And we see, I'm, I'm a generation extra, and I see all the things that could happen with that whole live streaming, but that is something that, you know, they would want to yeah. do, and that's going to be a conflict for us. As they, as they bring in new ideas, we're going we're gonna to be so one-sided because it's change for us, and Coach K talked about that whole change piece. We're going to have to be receptive of, of that and listen to their ideas and just, 
and work together as a team, team sea change, and getting uh, the message across. Because there is going to be a lot of conflict because we're going to have to, it's going gonna, it's gonna to demand that we do things differently. Yeah. So let me wrap this up by just articulating a couple of themes. So a couple times in different ways, Bill started it. There was this notion that none of our initiatives, we're, gonna, we're not going to change society by working just with one generation. We have to work across the generations. We do have this large bolus of people who will be the next generation up that we're going to face, we are facing and will continue to face. We also talked a little bit about this notion that there is a top-down and a bottom-up approach that we've typically been bought into and I think we're still bought into that notion. How do we affect change on the ground and how at the same time do we drive the large? And that gets more closely built to your issue of the ideological differences that we face. And I think the, the, the truth, whether we like it or not, is that we do have an entrenched uh, leadership and bureaucracy in our political system, both in the government and in the, in the two parties. They are entrenched in a model of working that makes it hard to drive past that stuff. So yes, we have to do a better job of telling stories. We have to do a better job of getting in their attention than we have in the past we being the collective community. Uh, but at the same time, we can't ignore that they're there. So we have solutions happening on the ground because people are filling holes that they see or they have ideas about how to polish the, I forget what you would, polish the apple. Yeah, or polish the wheel, yeah. shine it up, right? <laughs> polish things up and clean it up. But at the same time, we do have forces that are capping, if you will, our ability to change. So the question is, how do we, number one, what I heard today from you all, was how do we tap into that energy, that excitement, that ability to solve problems at the community level, especially with the millennials. But we also have to attack this cap that's over us that we can't seem to get beyond. And we saw it in the health reform debate. We're seeing it in this year's election. We're all looking at it befuddled as to how we can even be having these arguments, yet we are. Well, I want to ask everybody to just join me in thanking this uh, great group of people for spending time with us this morning. And thank you all. I really appreciate it. And thank, you. Thank, you. thank you again. Thank you. You're doing great, great job. work. Thank you.